Entry 44. I had no idea what to expect from this library. Even that didn't stop me from feeling surprised when I finally saw it. Crane walked me over there after I told him that I wanted to see it. On the rather long walk over there, he asked me about my past. What I'd been doing before meeting him. Um, it's obviously a long story. One well, that's quite hard to explain, but I gave him the gist of it. I told him about the Earth I knew. Clear skies, nature, civilizations, all of it. He probably thought I was mental. But I'd been through so much. I created this fictitious utopia in my head. I didn't say any of this out loud, but I could tell that he didn't believe a single word that I said. In all honesty, I couldn't care less. None of it really mattered anyway. He led me to a singular, small, unassuming building surrounded by nothing. It almost looked like a ticket booth. I looked at him questioningly. He just gestured for me to go in. It's all down there. All you want to know. Password is crisis. He walked away after saying that, leaving me alone to stare at the peculiar structure in front of me. I walked in through the small entryway and was faced with an opening in the floorboards. There was a ladder going downwards. I took it, descending into the darkness for about twenty minutes. As I hopped off the last rung, I found myself in what looked to be a lobby with metal walls and floors. In front of me were large iron doors with an alphabetical panel to the side. There were overhead lights. They weren't on. Instead, everything was illuminated by large candles. I entered the password. They slid open. I could barely even begin to describe what I saw. It was beautiful, to say the least. There were rows and rows of books and manuscripts stacked on pristine white shelves. There were breathtaking light structures of historical figures set up on the side of a spiral staircase leading down to the other floors. Again, the only sources of light were candles and lamps, so it gave off an extremely ambient vibe that just made everything feel more stunning and surreal. I snapped back from my trance into reality. I heard a voice call out from somewhere behind me. I turned around, seeing a meek-looking 30-ish year old man staring at me in confusion. I struggled to spit out the words, but I finally got an introduction out. I haven't seen you before, the man responded. Yeah, I am. Um, I just got here, I suppose. He nodded. Well, I'm Void now. After that brief exchange, we just stared at each other for a while. Eventually, I piped back up. So, uh, uh, um, sorry, so... What do you do? He smirked, gesturing to the books around him. I'm learning. Constantly. Facing together the past, if you will. It's just you here. Renata. Didn't used to be. I had friends down here, but they're all gone. Monsters. Seas. It's tough to survive, if you know. And the guys on the surface, well, they all got bored of this place. Can't read too well either, so it's just me. You said that you're piecing together the past. Master. So what happened? He went on to explain everything to me. Well, everything that he's figured out from reading, archiving, analyzing the books and documents down here anyway. Apparently, the Soviet Union never dissolved in 1991 here. See, in this timeline, the USSR didn't only take over Eastern Europe. Most of the West also went with it. In other words, they didn't grow weaker over the years, only stronger. In the Cold War, it wasn't only between the US. Soviets also had China to worry about. The Kuomintang actually won the Chinese Civil War here. That meant the Chinese Communist Party never came into true power. But even the Kuomintang didn't last too long. In 1995, China officially became a liberal democracy, meaning they had a lot more in common with the US than with the USSR. This was also around the time when the Soviets really stopped treading lightly. They were beating America in the space race, and were now trying to beat them in the nuclear arms race as well. When China established democracy, the Soviets took this as a direct threat from the US and claimed that they were trying to impose their will on the rest of the world. Even though China had come to their consensus all on their own, the Soviets used this as an excuse to bolster their nuclear arsenal even more. Things were starting to become more dangerous. In response to this, China increased their own nuclear firepower and officially allied with the US. 
This move was highly contested by the Eastern European countries that remained free, notably the UK, France, and Ireland. They claimed that this would cause the Soviets to officially try and invade them. The situation started escalating even more. In this timeline, the Americans hadn't gotten a man on the moon until 2001. The Soviets did it two years later in 2003. The problem was they had set up their moon base dangerously close to the US one, only about 200 meters away. They claimed that this was by accident. Nobody believed them. Things really started going to shit in the winter of 2007. France had been keeping the details of their own nuclear arsenal under wraps in order to avoid spite from the USSR. However, all their plans were leaked by a Soviet spy working discreetly in Paris. To them, a hidden nuclear program meant war. They moved into France just a few months later. News about the invasion spread across the world like wildfire. The Soviets ordered that the French give up their weapons and sovereignty, becoming a part of the USSR. However, they didn't comply. The invasion lasted three months and would eventually be recognized as the inception of the apocalypse. The US, along with the UK, Ireland, Korea, and China, all sent troops over to aid the French. This is when they realized that the Soviets had been keeping secrets of their own. With such a large portion of their nation budget going towards the military, they had developed new ground war weapons that caused ungodly devastation. Things like automatic rifles with explosive rounds, power armor, electric bombs, noxious gas that would spread too fast to be anticipated. Because of this, the Soviets managed to take France with minimal casualties, even with international help. Things started to look terrible. In 2011, they followed up by also forcibly annexing the UK and Ireland. They even moved into the Middle East, destroying all of America's already established military bases there. World War III was imminent. About three years pass, with no major occurrences taking place. The Soviets knew that if they made a move on China, the US would be right on their heels. In addition to that, they would also be backed by Japan and Korea, which unified the same year that China turned into a democracy. However, the peace didn't last. The following details were murky. All that can be confirmed was that when the Soviets decided to simultaneously send troops to China and America sometime in 2014, the nukes started flying. The East Coast and the Midwest of America were destroyed, along with Central Canada. All the provinces in West China, as well as the entirety of Korea, were decimated. The Soviets also suffered heavy casualties. Ukraine, Belarus, and a quarter of Russia were eradicated. In addition to that, there was also some botched nuclear strikes that went haywire, hitting North Africa, India, Central America. The world population plummeted that day, all in a nuclear war that lasted under a day. An estimated 2.8 billion people died. Hundreds of cities were destroyed. The radiation ended up killing even more. The years that followed were miserable for everybody involved. The Soviet Union disbanded almost immediately after the war, and the mass rebuilding of countries and cities went underway. Everybody tried to recreate a sense of normalcy in the world. It could never really be the same. The apocalypse had essentially occurred. But that wasn't even the worst of it. In 2015, a high-ranking Soviet general was found hiding in a town in eastern Germany. His name was Elias Richer. He didn't put up a fight when apprehended by the newly formed International Commonwealth. His trial was sent immediately and televised all across the world. During the entire duration, where the judge was reading out his war crimes, he remained stone-faced. That was until the very end. As he was about to be led to the electrocution room, he burst out laughing. It was a hysterical, nearly sadistic laugh. Everybody watched in shock as he began to speak. And this is the gist of what he said. Apparently, the Soviets had been developing an extremely experimental weapon since 1964. It was projected to be finished around 2035, but the sudden outbreak of nuclear war caused them to consider deploying it then. They had a vote within a seven-person committee involving some of the top scientists who had been working on the weapon at the time. A vote on whether it was time to use it or not. All seven scientists voted against it. They claimed that the weapon was unfinished and therefore too unstable to be utilized that it could lead to unfathomable consequences if something actually went wrong. The plan was seemingly scrapped. That wasn't until Elias decided that it wasn't an acceptable decision. Most everybody, including his superiors, tried to stop him, but in his intense, psychotic, militant desire to win the war, 
he started a mini coup with a group of like-minded soldiers and launched it to the dismay of everybody. So what was this thing? It was an antimatter weapon. A particle missile, or something to that effect. The details of what it really was remained a mystery for all time. The world would only know of its consequences, and apparently this one weapon was enough to wipe out the entirety of America, most of Canada, and all of Central America as well. It was the end game for the Soviets. With the US out of the picture, China likely wouldn't be able to handle them on their own, but something went terribly wrong. The launch was botched. It landed somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. Everybody in the courtroom went into a collective shock as he said that. If a weapon of that magnitude exploded underwater, that could mean... That could mean the apocalypse wasn't over. But Elias was quick to correct them. Supposedly, it wasn't explosive. It was something else. Something that humanity wasn't ready to understand. It wasn't supposed to blow up America. It was supposed to get rid of it. He also didn't know when or if it would activate. But if it did... That would be the true end of the world. He didn't elaborate on what that meant. His laughter started up again, but it quickly turned into a desperate sobbing. Tears streamed down his face as he repeatedly muttered out the words, I'm sorry. They interrogated him for weeks, trying to squeeze out any information. However, he just sat there and said that he couldn't help them anymore. They tortured him to no avail. And he died in 2018. The world feverishly scoured the Atlantic Ocean for years, but the task was seemingly impossible. They had an imprecise location, and they didn't even know what they were looking for. That was until 2022. There was an object about the size of a small car lodged into the seabed somewhere in the northern Atlantic. The first thing they saw was the red and yellow of the USSR flag. This was it. But nobody knew what to do with it, and upon closer inspection, the device almost seemed alien. Nobody wanted to risk touching it or operating on it. Things still weren't looking good. It was in the summer of 2026 when a breakthrough finally came. An American physicist and cryptologist by the name of Daniel Bouchon had discovered how to sift through the general logistics of the weapon without activating it. And in fact, he found something very interesting. But it probably wasn't what the world was hoping for. There was a countdown timer embedded somewhere deep in the code of the device. It read 1107 53 22 21 20 19 11 days. This thing was set to go off in just over 11 days. The world fell into a frenzy. Everybody was at a loss for what to do. Beyond discovering the countdown, Bichon hadn't managed to discover an off switch, or how to even begin to defuse it. It was just too complicated, and he was the brightest the world had to offer. As the days leading up to the inevitable started winding down, a massive evacuation into underground shelters went into place all over the world. Nobody knew what was going to happen. People were trying to defuse the weapon just four hours before it was set to go off, but they made zero progress. All they could do now was to wait and hope for the best. A few military aircrafts overlooking the Atlantic stayed out in order to provide a live feed of what was about to happen. The helicopters didn't notice anything during the first few minutes after the timer hit zero. But then they realized something. The ocean surface was getting farther and farther away from them. This wasn't even the weirdest part, however. The water was also getting darker for some reason. They soon figured out why. Something was rising up from beneath the ocean. It was a landmass, an unfathomably large one. As it ascended towards them, they got a good enough view of the surface. It was nothing that should have come from this world. The structures, plants, creatures on that place, they all looked absolutely alien. The helicopters decided to take off, fearing what else could happen, what else they could come face to face with. However, as soon as they started flying off, a wicked roar could be heard coming from somewhere right below them. The pilots frantically shouted a few words before the feed turned to static. Now only the top-ranking officials ever saw this. So the general populace was still in the dark of what happened on the surface. 
again, nobody knew what to do. There was no way in hell that the depleted world militaries could have any hope in quelling whatever the hell had leaked into the world. So they just waited, but for what? Nobody really knew. At this point, the history became hard to track. There were scattered reports of strange occurrences happening in the shelters. Things like the ground splitting below them, strange creatures breaking through the ceiling above, and even other people morphing into otherworldly things. The last recorded document present in the library was something during 2035. This is all it read. Can't stay here anymore. We just can't. The air is getting thinner down here for some reason, and we've been hearing these fucking moans coming from somewhere below us for months now. Yesterday, the floor started cracking, and a bunch of fucking eye stalks poked out of the rubble. They retreated back once we shot at them. We know that it isn't over. We've decided to leave soon. Franklin's sending up, up a nine-person unit to map out what the fuck's happening on the surface. I'm part of it, but to be honest... To be honest, I don't... I don't have high hopes. I was floored after hearing all this. I mean, I had no idea what to make of it, you know. What the hell are you supposed to think about something like this? God. I asked him about this library as well. It looks so nice. I don't see how they could have built it in such a place. He said they didn't. Apparently, they stumbled upon the settlement about four years ago when they got here. Nearly everybody was dead. The ones that were still clinging to life told them the password. They told them the history could not be lost forever. Somebody had to know. So fucked. You know, if these documents were accurate, it means that this world in this timeline was essentially ruined by one singular person. I need some time to process this. Entry 45. Shit, I don't know what's going on right now. It's the middle of the night and I just heard the loudest fucking sound ever coming from somewhere outside. I can't, descri I can't describe it. I know that I'm pretty lucky to be alive at this point, but I don't think this is sustainable. I know that I'm pretty... Oh. Wait. I hear gunshots now. Shit. Entry 46. Well, it's been crazy since that last entry... And this is what happened. First I thought just hiding in my bunker when I heard the commotion outside. Just wait it all out, I thought. But then I realized something. If this settlement was destroyed and I was the last one alive, well... I wouldn't be lasting long after that, would I? Conversely, if I decided to hide and they won, then Crane and the rest of the guys wouldn't be too happy with my cowardice. I made a decision. Grabbed the assault rifle under my bed, and I decided to head out there. If I died, then I died. Was this life really worth living anymore? As soon as I poked my head outside, I was hit with a sharp smell of metal. I looked around, seeing blood everywhere on the ground, but no bodies. So I heard a deafening stomping coming from behind me. I turned to see what looked like a massive humanoid walking around. And when I say massive, I don't mean ten feet tall. I mean over a hundred. He was picking up soldiers and crushing them in his gargantuan hands before slurping down their entrails and its face. Well, it didn't even have one. Its entire head was just one large spherical mouth. As I watched it, I also noticed it had scaly-looking skin that seemed to be shedding off as it moved. But no, it wasn't shedding. There were things falling off of it. I watched in horror as they spotted and started crawling towards me. As they got closer, I recoiled in horror. There were also humanoids crawling on all fours. They looked feral, like sickly gray skin, like the giant behemoth they came from. Their heads were also just one large mouth. They also seemed to be emitting some black gas that I didn't... I, I didn't want to risk breathing in. I shot down four of them before seeming to attract attention from the big guys. I thought it was fucked. It leaped towards me, but I managed to duck into a nearby warehouse. After scrambling around in there for a few seconds, the creature ripped the roof off and tried to swipe at me. Fortunately, I rolled away just in time. However, I sprained my ankle in the process and was left trying to scoot away helplessly. That's when I noticed something extremely disturbing about this thing. It had eyes in the back of its throat. They seemed to be connected to some kind of appendage as it bulged out at me. I locked vision with it for just a second before it reached out again. Not knowing what to do, I just closed my eyes. However, instead of feeling my body being crushed, I heard an explosion followed by an ear-splitting, unnatural roar. 
I opened my eyes to see that one of the creature's giant eyes had essentially burst open. Another rocket from an unknown source hit the creature in the chest soon after. While it was distracted, I managed to get away. I must have killed three more of those smaller creatures before I ran out of ammo. I was limping around trying to find somewhere to go. And that's when I saw the pit that I had encountered when I first got here. And I don't know why, but my mind started racing and I hastily made my way towards it. Once there, I collapsed and I peered into the murky mist below. Wait. Wait, I thought. Mist. Mist, was it? Or was it fog? It looked so familiar for some reason. Another roar from behind me caused my mind to sift through my memories even further. Why was this so damn familiar? Then it hit me. How we first got here, rust, the plane, the fog under the clouds. At that moment, I swear, I heard something coming from the pit. It was it. Was it birds? Birds. I was hearing a bird chirp. I felt the ground shaking behind me, and I knew this was my last chance. I pulled myself over the barricade and into the pit. I couldn't tell you how long I fell through the gray void. All I know is that things were suddenly dark at one point, and I felt an impact. But it wasn't hard ground. The area around me was soft and wet. I felt my hand come into contact with something slimy, squishy. I got worried for a second. But that's when I saw what it was. Earthworm. The stuff around me must have been dirt. I started looking around frantically, trying to place where I was, and eventually I spotted a light above me. I started crawling towards it. I was on what seemed to be an upwards incline, so the climb wasn't too hard, and eventually I broke out and I found myself in a place that felt alien to where I had been for the last few years. Nature. I was in some kind of forest that had just crawled out of a hole in the ground. It was foggy as hell. I could see the trees, the brush, the shrubs, the tree, the birds, all of it. I lay down for a while and I, f I fell into the state of euphoria. I guess somebody thought that I was crazy and walked over eventually because I heard a voice speaking. Some while later, I opened my eyes and a middle-aged man looking at me with an extremely concerned look. Are you alright? What in the bloody hell are you doing? He had what I assumed was a British accent. I had later found out that I ended up in Wales. Cardiff, to be exact. Tried to make some story up in my head, but it all came out in jumbled messes. He walked away soon after that. I couldn't really blame him, though. I must have looked and sounded like a madman. Eventually, I found my way out of the forest into a city street. I stumbled upon a public washroom. I cleaned myself up as best as I could there. I wasn't really sure what to do beyond that, though. I sat outside in the streets for a while. Even though I had no sign, I was tossed some change here and there, and eventually I'd mustered up enough cash to buy a bag of chips. Prepackaged sandwich at a convenience store. It tasted like absolute heaven. I devoured it in the store right in front of the cashier. I guess he saw my filthy, tattered jacket. My general unkempt appearance. I felt sorry for me. What's a young man like you doing homeless already? He asked me. I made us some story about how I flunked out of college. I was still owing massive student debt and my parents wouldn't take me in anymore for some reason. <laughs> I guess he bought it because he offered me a job and a place to sleep in one of the back rooms. I started yesterday. However, I still had my suspicions about the world, so I did some research at a local library. I've got to say, the internet changed quite a bit while I was gone. Cell phones as well. It's kind of fucking insane, actually. I've got a lot of catching up to do. Anyway, my research yielded history that seemed to align with what I remembered, so that's excellent news. Out of curiosity, though, I searched up my parents' names. A few articles that came up, my dad had been killed in a workplace accident. My mom died a few years later from a parent prescription drug overdose. Maybe it's better for me not to think about that too much. Actually, I think I'll, I'll end this entry for now. Entry 47. I've realized that I need to get back to California somehow. It shouldn't be too hard. I made enough money here to buy a plane ticket and then fly over. I'm not so sure where I'm going to stay, however. Hotels have gotten a lot more 
expensive. I never even had many friends before I left. Well, I do have one. I don't know if he'd want to see me, though, or even if he'd recognize me. I'll give it a shot. Entry 48. Currently on a plane headed to Burbank. After that, I'll need to head over to Sacramento. However, I'm not sure if James still lives there or not. Hopefully he does. Entry 49. As it turns out, he's still there. Really wasn't expecting it, but it's great. Even better was that he welcomed me with open arms. God, he hasn't changed at all. As it turns out, his parents have moved back to Australia, and they left him the house with all the mortgage paid off, a lucky bastard. However, I wasn't sure how I was going to approach our first meeting after seven years. Obviously, I had a lot of explaining to do, but I wasn't sure if I was... if I was going to tell him the truth or not, especially... Eventually, I decided to. I could see the shock and disbelief on his face, and I told him what happened to me. But I could also tell that he believed me deep down. He knew that I had no reason to lie to him. Barely got through any of my story before I felt the drowsiness hit me. James was nice enough to offer me a bed here. That's where I am now. Guess I'll continue explaining everything to him tomorrow, but now I'll rest. Entry 50. I told James a bit more about where I'd been before he went off to work, but now that I'm here alone, I left to contemplate something that I'd never really wanted to. You see, before we left, Russ told me to do something in case we ever got separated in that world and I found a way back here without him. I would need to go back to Caltech. There was this one lecture hall where he'd hidden something in a secret compartment in one of the walls. There was supposed to be either one or two items in there, a box or a box and a note. If there was no note and only a box, that would mean that he had not made it back to our world. If that was the case, I would have to deliver the box to a specific address. It was his family. You see, as eccentric as Rust was, he still loved them deeply, enough to ensure full financial stability for them before he left. However, he didn't tell them the truth about where he was going, just that he was on a business trip. He always assumed that he was coming back, however... However, it turns out that wasn't the case. I went to Caltech in order to retrieve the box before coming to Sacramento. I found it. My heart dropped when there was no note. I opened the box to find a handwritten note directed towards his wife by Rust, as well as some addresses. He told me that after I delivered the box, to explain everything to them and tell them... Tell them he was truly sorry. Looked like I was going to have to do that soon. I've never been good at breaking bad news. Entry 51. James, this is the last entry for you. I know you're probably confused right now, but the best way that I can explain all of this is if you just read this journal. I'm gonna head off right now. Taking some items from your house in order to help me on my journey, but I promise that I'll get them back to you. You know I'm good for it. I'm sure that I'll see you again, my friend. It might not be anytime soon. See? There was somebody else that Russ told me to contact if he didn't make it back. He was a physicist who had known Rust since they were in college, but he wasn't based in Caltech. He worked for the government, for the higher-ups, if you will. Although he was also interested in the notion of a parallel reality, he wasn't ready to take on Rust's offer when he told him about his discoveries. It just sounded too far-fetched. He didn't want his superiors to think that he was crazy. Whoever came back, Rust wanted me to convince him that it was real. Now, I always thought that this was an unreasonable request. After all, how was I supposed to change his mind? My journal entries probably wouldn't even help. Could have made that all up. However, I found something in my jacket pocket that I had somehow forgotten about during my hectic stint in Heaven's Curse. There was a small piece of one of those shards we had mined for in the prison. I'll go to the other address, the physicist. The one that Rust had given me in order to demonstrate the shard on myself in front of him. I don't see how he could doubt me after that. He'd probably even give me a job. See, even though I never want to go back to that place myself, researching it from afar is still something that I want to do. Despite all that I've seen, all the places I've been to, 
There's still so many questions that have been left unanswered. I feel like it's my duty to find out, and also... Also to find Rust. If he's still alive in there. Well, uh... That was it. It's the end of the journal. What am I supposed to think about it? I don't really know. But I guess that the world out there, it's a lot bigger than I had originally thought. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing. Hey there, everyone who's listening on YouTube, or those of you who are listening on the podcast. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before you head out for the night, I just wanted to let you know about a couple of things. Without you, the show doesn't take place. So, if you guys would like to support the show, or if you guys would like to get your hands on a couple of cool little things whenever new things come out, check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and any support that you guys show, I really appreciate it. So everyone who's already donated to the Patreon, I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. I thank you so much for that. If you guys are looking for more Creepypasta Storytime, there's a new video that's uploaded to this channel or uploaded to the podcast every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday now. You can be able to get more from me at facebook.com slash mrcreepypasta or on Twitter at mrcreepypasta and then the number zero. Thanks so much for listening, kids, and for your support. And sweet dreams.